for business. I got my MBA to make money by the of the university, Salakara University, in Silicon Valley. During that time, in Silicon Valley, I had access to this incredible resource. During that time, as for foundation, there was an online platform called Social Age. This is very important because I think earlier uh, one of our people speakers said context matters. There were about 35,000 people per week on an online, it's by invitation only, one of the largest online platform of global social entrepreneurs was created as for foundation. And I would be always baffled by this thing. What are all these people talking about Africa and an Africans? My problem is Look, I'm from Eritrea. I grew up in raised there. I was raised. I was born and raised in Eritrea. Whoever wants to do good in Africa has a right to do good. The story of these people that I'm going to tell you, because their story is not told. The ones who send the money are the housekeepers, the child caregivers, the people who do the job that we, who have the opportunity to go to school and do something in our life, do not do. That were very stingy. But the ones who give the most are these incredible mothers and fathers. They work in hotels, and everything they do, they give back to their home. And it is amazing what they do. It is absolutely out of love. From the historical diaspora, suffering of 400 years. So I'm actually walking on their shoulder, benefiting of their suffering, trying to make good for my community. So we, the diaspora, sometimes have to reflect and be humble enough to know that we actually get to be where we are because some other people paid the price. The next thing that we need to remember is if we are giving and giving unconditionally, I think we also have to ask the question, who are we giving it to? Why are we giving it? And what are they doing the, the, the money with? The money. Send the money back to Eritrea to never see it again during their retirement. So there is this ugly side of giving that we also need to recognize. But what's difficult about this is that the power is there. How we harness it matters. Why is this conference very important to me? 21 hours on the flight, and I came in this morning, so my energy is up. <laughs> um, and it's crazy, but it is very important. We have not talked about the state of philanthropy. We've been asking people to give us. What about us? So, okay, that stubbornness which I was stuck after I say this. When we came up with the idea to start African Diaspora Network, I asked my wonderful husband, we have two children. So for many years, what did we do like every other diaspora? Those of us who were lucky to build our life in Silicon Valley. But at this point, it gets very boring, because all you're doing is building up for yourself. But I am trying to say to the community where I live, Silicon Valley Community Foundation, it's only 10 minutes from my house in Mountain View, I live in Sunnyvale. $13 billion in fund. It's donor advised fund to show about that. But Elon knows about it more than I do. What does that mean to me as an African woman leading an organization in Silicon Valley? Absolutely nothing. We never see the penny from them, maybe a thousand here, a thousand there. Yeah. Because what we do is not necessarily touching their core. And yet, every penny goes back home. We must find a way to relieve them. There's been good recognition of the diaspora uh, by the uh, African government, the development agencies, and of course the diaspora itself has become more conscious of its own uh, power. And uh, this has led to, uh, of course, the African Union in 2004, recognizing the diaspora as Africa's sixth region. And uh, in, in turn, a lot of African governments are recognizing the diaspora, setting up directorates of diaspora affairs, uh, and of course, uh, one complete manifestation uh, is dual citizenship. As of last December, 31 African countries recognized the diaspora. Uh, secondly, uh, the diaspora plays a major role in contemporary politics. Uh, whether you're talking about struggles for democracy, struggles for uh, development, uh, but also they get involved uh, sometimes for uh, negatively or positively uh, in African conflicts, generating those conflicts or resolving those conflicts 
and of course, it's been involved in post-conflict reconstruction. And then secondly, there is the social cultural contributions of diasporas. Uh, diasporas possess attributes uh, and, and skills, and they have access uh, to extensive transnational uh, social, political, and cultural networks that can be mobilized, and sometimes they do mobilize them uh, for the development and uh, democratization of their countries. Uh, let me talk thirdly about the economic contributions of the diaspora. Uh, we've already heard uh, you know, about remittances. There are four types of economic contributions uh, of the diaspora to Africa. One is remittances. Remittances to Africa by the diaspora, and that's the new diaspora, uh, increased from 50 billion uh, in 2007. Uh, last year, or in 2017, it was 69.5 billion, led by Nigeria with 22 billion, followed by Egypt with 20 billion. If you notice, my Africa is the whole continent. I'm not talking about the Sahara. Uh, how do we develop the next generation of academic staff? How do we develop effective leadership for African higher education institutions? And, and all this has an impact on the quality of the graduates we produce. And employers complain, our graduates are not ready. So employability data is very depressing when you look at it. For the developmental lag, we still have to undertake, namely infrastructure, industrialization, and so on. But also, what kind of skills are we providing for the fourth industrial revolution? We missed the first three, and we're still trying to recover that. And then there is the fourth. With these deficits, foreign investors, how far can we really go? So it is important, in my view, for the diaspora uh, and philanthropy in general to focus on higher education specifically. I had the privilege of being the chairperson of one of the pioneering um, diaspora development organizations for 13 years and worked with them for 22 years. So for the purposes of my presentation today, I would focus on how to expand and enhance African philanthropy. Traditional and historical African approach to philanthropy and what you do. And one of the elements in traditional African giving is the idea of sharing. So despite the problems we face in remittances, our money is sometimes not used the way we want it. We still keep doing it because it's a duty and that duty comes from sharing. In fact, in English and in many other Western languages, if you give me something, I will thank you. And in general courtesies, you will respond by saying you're welcome. In my language, one of you, and in many African languages, if I give you something and you thank me, my response is, it's your share. The second observation is, I think Una this morning mentioned how philanthropy is beginning to be so important that some African governments have begun to introduce it as part of their national development plans. And she mentioned Liberia, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. Ethiopia, in August of 2016, set up the Ethiopia Diaspora Trust Fund. It's a philanthropic platform, individuals make contributions. And I checked in February what the number was and it had just gone over $2 million. This is individuals making contribution for some social and civic work in Africa. But Rwanda, I think, is perhaps ahead of everyone else. In 2012, due to the political issues with um, conflict in Congo, some of the official development assistance to Rwanda was withheld by United States and other European countries. And suddenly there was a cash flow issue. And that, amongst other things, led Rwanda to set up what's called the Agachiro Fund, which was effectively philanthropy. 
But the significant push of Agachiro was from the diaspora, although it's not exclusively diaspora. I work with the, um, I consider myself a friend of Rwanda, I work with them a lot on that. I checked their published accounts for the end of 2016. Between 2012 and 2016, they had raised 43 million on the Agachiro Fund. And the Agachiro Fund is seen as a sovereign wealth fund. So people make donations to it, and it is invested. So it is not consumed, it is invested. So that's an important element. So still with my sort of afford motivation of how to expand and enhance, what other things can we do um, with diaspora philanthropy and African philanthropy in general? Today, I think um, the keynote speaker talked about not only endowment, but how he has in his company actually given shares in of his company to the charity. So my message is a legacy endowment, a regenerative endowment is extremely important and it needs to be done not only in creating the endowment capital and investing in ethical companies around the world, but actually giving the shares to the trust. That element is important. Now, if you do that, you can move it not only from a wealthy person setting such a fund, but we can do a similar fund based on aggregation through remittances. The reason why remittances, we're talking of 69 million, in fact, in February, the World Bank up their numbers, they did the revision, this, for all of Africa, it's about 80 billion remittances. Now, that 80 billion, it is comprised of a whole number of small contributions of $1,000, $200, $500. But why is it significant is the aggregation. So, it is possible to aggregate on the basis of trust funds like Agachiro and many other things we can do now with online platform to aggregate funds and do this sort of endowment that I think is needed. Third comment I want to make is even in the field of philanthropy, supposedly the love of humanity, even in this ratified field, we cannot escape from the interminable conflicting and complex nature of humanity. Earlier in the discussions, I heard a surprising suggestion that religion and corruption do not go together. They do. <laughs> Humanity is so complex and conflicted. In fact, religion is partly motivated by the want to fight corruption and sin and sinfulness. So they are so in this area of philanthropy, the reason why we ended up with the notorious log frame and the emerging theories of change is to fight against fraud, waste, and dysfunction in giving. So when we worry about the managerialism of the log frame, let's just remember that it didn't come due to the evil nature of some bureaucrat. So the lesson for me is let us be pluralist. Let us use different methods and have different options, not necessarily each one of them the panacea. Most of us CSOs are individuals who receive money. It is consumptive giving. So you give me, I consume 100% of it. If I'm lucky, I consume 95% and save and build on 5%, but that's the fault. What about if you are able to give me in a manner where I'm only consuming less than 50% and the rest 
is to build this resilience so that I don't come back to you. And why is that important? It's not just a philosophical point. It's a deeply significant economic point. And it's not necessarily common sense. For the longest time in the history of humanity, we all have the common sense that famines are caused by the lack of food. Until Amatia Sen came and told us that that's not the case. It's the lack of food security. So the floods in Mozambique, the biggest problem is not necessarily that the floods happen, but the point that one is not able to deal with the floods. So this productive exit-based giving, which a philanthropist can do, enables me to be more resilient to deal with floods, whether they come or not. Thank you very much. at uh, muting revolution and the transformative aspiration of serfs and workers uh, by throwing uh, the idea that charity would postpone revolution and later its growth into some sort of social engineering that saw poverty as the responsibility of the poor as opposed to the structural nature of the economy and its repressive structure. So it is useful Therefore, when we're talking about this, that we don't enter into the same historical denialism about the function of structure within the economy, the function of policy and predatory external interests, the function of certain ideological uh, deployments. Do you call my grandmother poor? She really will be... Um, female bad that you call her poor. We need to move out of that language of using the word poor. It's completely disempowering. We are not poor. Considering there are so many of us in the African diaspora and on the African continent, and we have such spending power, um, and this is coming from a student and a scholar, is it important that we reposition the mainstream narrative? Should we continue calling this diasporic or African diaspora or African philanthropy? Or do we start, need to start seeing ourselves as central to global philanthropy and central to moving this agenda of you know, love for humankind and all that kind of stuff and uh, mobilizing funds for positive social change? Is it time for us to change the language or does it not really matter as long as actually the dollars are there? Uh, and if the notion of Africa we have adopted, you know, when I was saying earlier, certain descriptions of Africa that are really directly from the colonial library. By Africa, we mean sub-Saharan. This is Herkel's construct. So we need to examine the language we use. Uh, and uh, a lot of us who are social scientists, and in fact historians, we've been fighting the use of uh, these kinds of descriptions of ourselves, our people, uh, for the last 60, 70 years. So first of all, language. Um, is very important. And I feel like they're actually tied, the question of language and the question of should we be calling it African philanthropy. One of the things about more philanthropy that I'm determined to do is to sit very comfortably in my ancestry and sit very comfortably in my knowledge and my, um, my knowledge, my power, whatever that is. And I think that we occupy both spaces. I was talking earlier with someone, my father belongs to one of these social clubs in the US. 
and I was looking through their journal one day and I asked him, I said, you know, Daddy, how much do you all have in your endowment? It was the same size as the first foundation that I ran. And I was like, why are you not in the spaces that I'm in? Why are you all not? They're just quietly doing their work, but there's a time for quiet and I think there's a time for voice. And so I think it's actually both. I think you need to occupy those spaces um, because again, the myths perpetuate. So let me just uh, answer to the celebrating of the diaspora. I said she is one of them. And let me uh, say why the African Diaspora Network, we look at our vision and mission. It is bringing Africans and friends of Africa together to make a difference in the continent where we come from and the communities in which we live. The latter is very important. The diaspora is a diaspora because we live somewhere. So let me just talk about where I live. <laughs> Silicon Valley, I'm going to give you a number. One out of every 11,600 people in San Francisco is a billionaire. <laughs> so why shouldn't I leverage these resources that's available to me? I think we need to think a little bit differently about doing things solo. We, the diaspora, cannot solve this big, massive, giant, 700 million people. I mean, whether I use the word poor or not, it doesn't matter. But 700 million people in Africa cannot make ends meet. That's the reality. If we want to hide that, then that's a problem. But this is the fact. In order for us to really do what Paul is talking about, what my colleague here is talking about, to try to endow and to really create sustainable funding we must leverage our friends. The African Diaspora Network is funded by Africans and friends of Africa, and for that, I'm very grateful. Why is that important? I really think that even though I'm an Eritrean, that's just one very peace aspect of me. I've only lived in that country for 19 years. The rest of my life, I've lived outside. So the people with whom I interact day in, day out, the friends of my children, friends of my husband, my community in Silicon Valley, I belong to that community just as much as I belong to Africa. I think we need to be very clear about this because if we don't, then it becomes a zero-sum game and no one wins. My community in Silicon Valley has to be sustained in order for me to have the capability to even give any money above and beyond my income or anything that I have left. This morning, I think it was also Una who referenced the point that we contribute time, talent, and treasure, which goes to the point that our contribution is billion dollars. So that I accept fully. And in the work we do at Afford and other areas, this is integral to our work. I do have an issue as to do I want to go all the way and de-dollarize totally? The only reason I'm hesitating about that is because the reality today is that a significant part of the things that affect our daily lives and our welfare is counted in money terms. And so my approach, right or wrong, would be I should be able to do quite well within that dollarized system without losing my other ways of measuring. The diaspora is actually a, a very diverse uh, you know, set of people, institutions, practices, networks, uh, and it is global, as, as we said. It is in the politics, in the economics. It is also the really positive things. It is engaging very problematic issues as well. I think that we shouldn't forget that there have been very conflicts on the continent and in other parts of the world. It's not only peculiar to the African diaspora. Well. It speaks to the need to integrate this continent and consider it as one country to build. I, I think I'm thinking of an African as a one country to build with this diversity, it, you know, integrated with the complex country. But we need to uh, constant all the barriers that we have set up in our process. Uh, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I think this was a great panel. Yes. Yes.